Good morning, Salt House. Good morning. Good morning. Wasn't that really cool, this little liturgy, litany of the elements? We got earth and wind and water and fire. I'd like to add a couple. We also have Zizal, <laughs> which is helpful on uh, All Saints Sunday, or uh, St. Francis Day. Uh, we've got Zyrtec is here. Yeah, uh-huh. Uh, this one's Azelastine. It's pretty good. It'll take the edge off. Um, if your eyes water, we got a little Sustain is here. Um, and uh, Singular will really do the trick if you need it. Um, so these are just a few tips from your most allergenic pastor who gets to <laughs> preach on St. Francis Day. Um, Lindsay is going to get us started with a quick gospel reading. I want you to just hear all of the creation that is mentioned in this story. Jesus continued this teaching with his disciples. Don't fuss about what's on the table at mealtimes, or if the clothes in your closet are in fashion. There is far more to your inner life than the food you put in your stomach, more to your outer appearance than the clothes you hang on your body. Look at the ravens, free and unfettered, not tied down to a job description, carefree in the care of God, and you count far more. Has anyone by fussing before the mirror even gotten taller by so much as an inch? If fussing can't even do that, why fuss at all? Walk into the fields and look at the wildflowers. They don't fuss with their appearance, but have you seen color and design quite like it? The 10 best-dressed people in the country look shabby alongside them. If God gives such attention to wildflowers, most of them never even seen, don't you think he'll attend to you? Take pride in you? Do his best for you? What I'm trying to say here is to get you to relax. Not be so preoccupied with getting so you can respond to God's giving. People who don't know God and the way he works fuss over those things. But you know both God and how he works. Steep yourselves in God reality, God initiative, God provisions. You'll find all your everyday human concerns met. Don't be afraid of missing out. You're my dearest friends. The Father wants to give you the kingdom him itself. Be generous. Give to the poor. Get yourselves a bank that can't go bankrupt, a bank in heaven, far from bank robbers, safe from embezzlers, a bank you can bank on. It's obvious, isn't it? The place where your treasure is, is the place you will most want to be and end up being. Thanks, Lindsay. It's really appropriate that St. Francis Day falls in the middle of this sermon series on stories, because we're talking about all the ways that God shows up in your story, which is kind of an idea that St. Francis had himself. You know, the most famous quote attributed to St. Francis is, preach the gospel always, and if necessary, use words. So friends, today we're going to take a look at uh, how God showed up in Francis's story, kind of like a little case study on the story of Frank. That sound okay? <laughs> All right. Because as we've discussed, St. Francis's story also begins in Shalom. Francis was born in Assisi, Italy in 1181 to an Italian father and a French mother. Francis was actually baptized with the name Giovanni, um, but his father was a lover of France. He, his father was a silk merchant who was always away in France, and he was away when Francis was baptized, which is how his mother gave him the name Giovanni. But when the father returned, he started calling him Francesco, which meant little Frenchman, eventually shortened to Francis. His father absolutely delighted in him. He taught him the trades and how to be a silk merchant. And Francis was obsessed with music growing up. His biographers claim that he was witty and gallant and always well-dressed. He had a lavish youth. His adolescent years were full of delight with a reputation for being the town trickster. Stories abound of Francis rallying the other boys into mischief. It's like, you don't think about mischievous saints, do you? But like most of them had a wild childhood. 
He was also an athlete who engaged in sports, and he would throw large feasts and lavish parties for his friends. And yet at a young age, Francis showed a heart for the poor. One day, he took some of his father's wares to market. The story says that he was selling fine velvet. And a beggar passed through the market and was rebuked and shunned by the other vendors. Eventually, this man was driven out of the market by the, sort of the harassment of mob justice. But the story goes that Francis chased after him, and he went to find the beggar, and he gave him all of the money that he'd made so far that day. When he got back to the market, his friends teased him and um, mocked his charity. And at home, his father scolded him in a rage. Perhaps this was a first shattering for Francis. I mean, ridicule from your friends or shame from your father, doing something you believe in and being met with harassment. That's a little relatable. But Francis's story had another distinct shattering, and his shattering was a result of war. Perugia, a neighboring village, went to war with Francis's hometown of Assisi. Francis, like many young men, enlisted to be a knight. He went to battle. He was captured and taken a prisoner of war where he was detained for over a year. I mean, think about it. St. Francis, a knight in shining armor, a military man, but also a prisoner of war. As a society, we've never really talked well about how war shatters a person. I mean, even now, as rockets are again flying in the Middle East, it's hard for many of us that have never known the threat of war to fully grasp what witnessing that violence does to a human. And yet, this is a trauma that's really common in our world. Francis had that trauma in his story and likely carried a bit of it in his body for most of his life. And when the war ended and Francis was released, he found himself sickly and weak. It took time for him to recover, and in the meantime, he took comfort in prayer and reading the scriptures. He found in them a God who was concerned with the oppressed, the marginalized, those who were beaten by violence, and those that were harmed by poverty. When he returned to his public life, he went back to his carefree ways. He played sports, he threw parties, but he quickly found that it was less enticing. The mischief and the hijinks of his youth were not quite as satisfying. He was not compelled to take up the merchant life of his father. He was convinced that war was the only thing he was good at. So Francis joined another military expedition, but he found that the fighting was also meaningless to him. He had visions of God telling him to return to Assisi, so he did. But this time it was different. He didn't play sports, he didn't throw parties. Instead, he announced that he was going to be married to Lady Poverty. And he began begging alms for the poor, he prayed in churches, and he took pilgrimages to various holy sites around Europe. Francis was probably searching for shalom this whole time. I mean, this return to the military, the begging, the praying, it was all part of that for him. But on one particular pilgrimage, he had a vision that sent him on an entirely new quest. While praying in a collapsing church, he stared at the face of Jesus on the cross. And he had a vision of Jesus looking down on him and saying, Francis, go and repair my church, which as you can see, is falling into ruins. And Francis looked around this collapsing building that he was sitting in, and he finally understood. His life was shattered, and so was this building. He would find his way back to Shalom by rebuilding this church. So Francis went to his father's shop and stole a spool of silk, and he sold it. And he, um, then he brought the money to the priest at the church so they could rebuild the roof. But the priest declined the money, and Francis lost it. He threw the money on the ground, like this is his calling, this is his path back to Shalom, this money has to be the way to do it. He knew that his father would not forgive him for stealing the fabric, so he hid for nearly a month in a cave. He was ashamed and hopeless, and eventually starving and dirty, and so sick and unwell, he went back to his family. And his father was furious. He beat Francis and bound him, he locked him in a storage room. His mother eventually freed him, and he returned the money to his father, but his father was not satisfied. He still took him to court over the crime of stealing, and in the middle of the town square, with all the church officials and the merchants and the townspeople gathered, Francis ripped off all of his clothes and stood completely naked 
he laid them at his father's feet, renouncing his father, his lineage, and any claims to his father's wealth. A family, like, totally divided. And from that point on, he wore the brown Cossack tied at the waist. It's that look that we associate with Catholic monks today. But Francis didn't understand. His vision was to rebuild that church. So he began to travel and to beg alms. He requested money to use to fix the roof. His travels eventually took him to the town of Gubbio. And in Gubbio, the townspeople came to him and said, Brother Francis, you're a man of God. We need your help. Our town is plagued by a ferocious wolf. It attacks in the night and eats our sheep. Our people are terrified, our farmers, our children. No one feels safe. We've assembled a hunting party, but it's a beast unlike anything we've ever seen. We need God's help, Francis. Like, what can we do? So Francis met with the farmers, and then met with the scared children, and then met with the hunting party. And after speaking to all of them, Francis said, now I need to meet with the wolf. And Francis went out into the wilderness, and as the story goes, he returned with the wolf by his side. And he told the townspeople, my friends, our brother the wolf is injured. He's unable to run and hunt. He's only eating your sheep because he's hungry. If you feed him, he'll protect your town. And I mean, this would sound crazy today, but there was nothing like this at the time. No one was thinking about animal rights. There was not a vegan to be found. <laughs> the church taught that humans were above animals, but Francis saw that all of creation was sacred and good. In fact, in art, Francis is often depicted as having a sparrow on his shoulder because when he was traveling from town to town, it said that he preached sermons to the birds. We have Francis to thank for the donkey and the nativity scene, that when Francis would put on live nativities, he'd add a donkey and a cow to show that all of creation worshiped. Eventually, Francis did collect enough money to rebuild that collapsing church, and he worked at great lengths to restore the roof. And when he finished, he continued on, begging for alms and rebuilding collapsing churches around Italy, France, and Spain. And in this time, he'd gathered some followers, some of these disciples appreciated his vow of poverty and his vision to rebuild churches. And so Francis began to share the gospel with them, which was unusual because he wasn't ordained or authorized by a church to do so, which at that time, which sometimes today, preaching like this was heresy. Eventually, Francis went to Rome and petitioned the Pope to allow him and his followers to form a new monastic order, one that was completely devoted to living simply begging for alms and helping the poor. The Pope granted the order, which at the time became known as the Friars Minor. This means lesser brother. But today we call this order the Franciscans. And the Franciscans grew in number, taking seriously Francis's teachings to follow the teachings of Jesus, walk in his footsteps, and help the poor. At the same time though, that Pope, Pope Innocent III, which is a really ironic name in history, was raging a deadly crusade against Muslims in Jerusalem and across North Africa. And Francis, as you recall, was a veteran knight. He knew something about the violence and the trauma of war. So Francis decided that he could pause rebuilding churches to intervene in this crusade. He believed that he could stop the violence if he converted the Sultan of Egypt from Islam to Christianity. So Francis did an unthinkably brave thing. Armed with only this brown sack clothing, he traveled to the capital of Egypt, where the Christian armies had launched a bloody and futile attack on the Egyptian soldiers. A ceasefire was eventually called, and in that brief period, Francis slipped across enemy lines. He approached the palace of Sultan al Kamil, and he boldly requested an audience with the Sultan. And for some surprising reason, it was granted. He was sure that if this conversion happened, all the violence would stop. But after meeting with the Sultan for several days, something interesting happened. They developed a deep respect for one another. They found similarities and differences that they admired. They engaged in what was perhaps like the first documented interfaith dialogue. The Sultan was not converted, but the two became good friends. I mean, can you imagine if we had such leadership in the world today? We need peace like that. So do you see our storytelling circle kind of coming about? 
Like Francis is born in this abundant life of shalom. He has sports and friends and parties and the love of his father. And then his life is shattered by shame and ridicule and war. There's loss of family and loss of reputation. And then he searches. He searches this path from God back to shalom, which he thinks involves rebuilding churches. He's like, collapsed buildings are going to be his thing. But here's the surprise. In his pursuit of restoring dilapidated buildings, he expanded Christian theology to consider nature, animals, birds, and beasts. He started a new monastic order devoted to poverty and helping the poor as the focus of the church. And he opened dialogue between Christianity and Islam at a time of war. Like God did some incredible things through Francis, even when Francis didn't quite understand. Martin Luther talks about this phenomenon as the priesthood of all believers. Essentially, Luther argued, it's, it's big, it's exciting. <laughs> Luther argued that each of us has a calling given to us by God in our baptism. And that calling is how you love your neighbor. So perhaps that calling is to be a teacher or a nurse or a social worker. Maybe it's to be a partner or a parent, or maybe you're really screwed and you're called to be a pastor. <laughs> But it is always amazing how God's calling shows up, even when we don't fully understand them. I mean, Francis rebuilt the church in ways he never expected. And maybe this is true in your story too. Maybe there are things you've resisted. Maybe think there are things that don't mean exactly what you thought they meant. Maybe your shattering or your searching keeps you from seeing the bigger picture. And maybe God is doing something wonderful in your story that you don't even understand yet. But all of that's getting a little ahead of ourselves. We'll do a little more story work next week. So let's look at one more parallel to Francis's story. If you recall the text that Lindsay read for us just a minute ago, Jesus says some really cool things in this sermon from Luke's gospel. He says things like, don't fuss over what you wear. Trust that God will provide what you need. Look to nature to see God's abundance. Look to the animals to see God's goodness. Be generous. Give to the poor. Value friendship. It seems that this wisdom from Jesus shaped Francis' life. His story involves the shame, and it involves trauma. It's a path that he doesn't understand, but it also involves all of these other things. Not fussing over what you wear. Trusting that God will provide what you need. Look to nature to see God's abundance. Look to the animals to see God's goodness. Be generous. Give to the poor. Value friendship. Are any of these things relevant to you? Do any of these themes show up in your story? Are there any of these themes that you're resisting in your story? I mean, obviously, there's a lot more to Francis' story, too. At one point, he got shipwrecked. He actually destroyed a monastery that he built because he thought it got too uh, gaudy in the a W sense, not the O sense. He had several other visions from God and several other injuries too. And to be honest, as I read a couple biographies of Francis this week, I'm not sure he understood his own story. He wrestled with a lot of embarrassment and shame up until his dying day. Like, I don't know if he understood the impact that he had. And I'm not sure if he would say he found Shalom again which is why I think it's important for us to study our stories. Not because they are perfect or tidy, but because there are lots of unfinished, untidy, unjust, and difficult things in them. Because God is always at work in nature, in animals, in visions, and in stories like yours. I mean, the voice of Jesus has a calling for you. And perhaps that is through your job or your family or your hobbies. Maybe it's your passions or some cause that tugs at your heart. But there is a way that we need you to rebuild and restore the world. Again, maybe like Francis, you don't understand it completely. But maybe like Francis, your story has something divine to teach us all. Because Francis' story reminds us that God is always in the business of rebuilding and restoring. And your story might be a part of that. Amen?